Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Brad Erford, President of the American Counseling Association, and uh, I have uh, two distinguished guests uh, with me today who are going to be uh, uh, candidates uh, for President-elect-elect -elect in the elections that will be coming up from December 1st, 2013 uh, through January 31st, 2014. Um, to my uh, uh, far right, Dr. Thelma Duffy and Dr. Perry Francis, uh, both colleagues that I uh, have known and loved for years and years and years, and I can proudly say that regardless of the outcome of the election, uh, two things. One, we're going to have a fantastic ACA president. The second is both of them are going to be ACA presidents over the next few years. I am certain of it. So uh, we're going to do something a little different this year. We've been asked to videotape uh, a, uh, a kind of a question and answer uh, with the candidates. So we have some prepared questions, and as time allows, uh, as we get to closer to the end, uh, we'll ask if there's any questions from the audience that they might like to uh, ask our uh, candidates. Uh, in the um, uh, preliminary discussion, we've decided that Dr. Duffy will go first on the first question, and then we will counterbalance <laughs> the presentation throughout the rest. The first question that I have uh, for both of you today is how would ACA introduction. introduction oh is an introduction <laughs> yes so let's begin with Dr. Duffy. Excellent well good morning everyone. Good morning. I'm so pleased and happy to be here today and very grateful to the Association for Creativity and Counseling and the Association for Counselor, and Edu uh, Counselor Education and Supervision for this nomination. I'd also like to congratulate our colleague Perry Francis on his nomination. Congratulations. Thank you. So I suspect that one of the questions that you'd like to have answered today relates to what I would bring to the table if I were your elected representative. And I'm hoping to not only answer that question, but any others that you might have. If we're not able to do that here because of the brevity of our time or because of the structure, and you see me out and about, please feel free to flag me down or contact me. So you know how those early experiences that we have have a way of leaving an imprint on us? Well, that was certainly the case for my first professional experience. I worked in a junior high school with children and adolescents who truly hurt. They ranged in age from 12 to 16 years old. And I wasn't a whole lot older than they were. I was a 20-year-old recent college graduate. We had uh, very limited financial resources, and our needs were very great. And we used our imaginations, and we were resourceful, and we accomplished many, many goals along the way. And we had a whole lot of fun doing it. What was really important about that experience for me was that it was there that I learned about the power of and the need for advocacy and connection. It's where I learned about my own capacity for tenacity. It's where I learned about the healing power of creativity. And since then, I've had the privilege of working in practice with adolescents, college students, older adults, individuals, couples and families, people facing all sorts of, of addictions and grief and loss. And I've done that for 23 years. And I um, offer my services in English and Spanish. And so, why would my history be important? Well, I'd like to communicate that I truly care about this work that we do. And I've been in this profession long enough to see all the amazing strides we've made. And I also know the work we still have left to do. The continuing concerns around counselor parity and client access to our services are critical issues facing our profession. I've been a longtime owner of a group practice that includes a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and several professional counselors. And I know firsthand about the hard work that we do and the acute need for equity in our reimbursement. As a two-time member of the ACA Governing Council, I'm also aware of all that ACA has done on our behalf and continues to do on our behalf. But I believe that there's something that we can do too. I believe that we need to be moved to 
Educate the public, the public, legislators, other mental health professionals on who it is that we are and what it is that we do. And I believe that that would call for creative and collaborative action. As some of you might know, I've been involved with promoting creativity and collaboration in, in our field. About 15 years ago, I started chairing a series of conferences that focused on creativity. And then later, in collaboration with my most esteemed colleagues, we successfully spearheaded a new division within ACA, the Association for Creativity and Counseling. And I can't tell you how pleased I am that ACC will be celebrating its 10th anniversary next year and that our membership has grown far past its, its university roots in Central Texas to a membership that is reflected worldwide. The current president and I were looking at the membership roster the other day and we saw that there are 12 countries represented in our membership. As uh, professional counselors, we do live all over the world. And much like a family, we're diverse in our interests, our approaches, and our specializations. And like a family, we are stronger when we are united. My greatest takeaway in leadership has been the power of thinking big, working hard, very hard, enlisting and supporting others, and creating something together that none of us could begin to do alone. That's what I would wish to do as ACA president and with you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Thelma. Perry? Good afternoon or good morning, whichever, whichever we're at so far. My name is Perry Francis and I'm one of the two candidates for ACA president. I came to be involved in ACA in kind of an accidental way. It started with the American College Counseling Association. I've been a campus pastor for the Lutheran Church for five years, and, and that was during that time I was working on my master's and my doctorate in uh, counseling. And I was encouraged because I work in, worked in student affairs and basically in college counseling because as a campus pastor, the two things I did the most was teach and counsel. And I was encouraged to be a part of, a, of an organization that was just beginning. ACPA had pulled out of, of ACA and the American College Counseling Association was getting started. They said they need a student member to be on their executive committee. And I said, sure, I'll run. And this was at the Denver conference. And about nine months later, I got this phone call from Donna Ford, who's a former ACA president, was the ACCA president at the time, and basically said to me, I wanted to let you know you lost, but the other person doesn't want to do it, so would you be open to doing it? <laughs> sure, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to, I think. Um, and it was at that point I ended up in Oregon at a executive council retreat learning about the American College Council Association. And it was from there that I began to take on different leadership roles in the organization. While practicing my craft as a college counselor, working with students, working with people who were struggling to make it through college for various reasons. Now both as a counselor educator and a counselor, I've always wanted to be able to practice what I teach. It sounds familiar, I like to practice what I preach. So here, I wanted to practice what I taught. And so every place I ended up, I continued to see clients, either through the counseling center or in my own private practice, making sure that, well, and, and we know this to be true. As counselor educators, we'll teach you, boy, we'll teach you everything that works. What we don't tell you though is that about it works about 90% of the time, if we're lucky. And so I wanted to make sure if I was going to teach something, if I was going to you know, offer something to my students, I wanted to make sure that I was doing that. Now, I'm very fortunate right now in that I'm a uh, counseling clinic training director. We have our own clinic 
for our program in the College of Ed at Eastern Michigan University. And it's there that I help to administer the clinic. I work with a, a marvelous group of colleagues who act as basically the supervisors of our staff, which of course are students. And in that, in that environment, I get to see clients and at the same time work with students as they learn to be counselors and at the same time work with colleagues as we help form future counselors. So how did I get from A to B? Well, it started, as I said, by accident. Somebody, and I don't know who it is. We can blame or thank them. I'm sure it's in the record someplace that Perry got started in this field. Uh, in the field of uh, being involved in the organization, and I would have been anyway because that's who I am. From there it was uh, executive council member for students at large and new professionals. From there the presidential cycle. From there other things that they assigned me to do. The presidents in the room know you never leave after you've been president. There's always something else they want you to do. I've served on 2020 uh, as the ACCA representative. Uh, I'm now uh, the Ethics Revision Task Force Chair. Um, uh, some president in their wisdom thought hey, he'd be good at that and work with a great group of colleagues there helping to revise the 2014 eth uh, the ethics, will, which will become the 2014 ethics. And continue to be involved as the governing council representative for the American, council, American College Counseling Association. So I bring with me a depth of understanding of the organization, a desire for a couple of things which you and I share. And that is that counseling Counseling is a profession that's in its late adolescence. We're still having to define it for, for the population, for legislators, and quite frankly, for just about everybody else, other people in the counseling mental health profession. Um, we've just finished coming up with a definition, uh, some scopes of practice, and trying to, to make a bit more concrete what the educational requirements are. But you know, when you go out there and try and define counseling for people, they hear the term in so many other places that it's incumbent upon us to be very clear and very bold and very upfront about what counseling is. And that's what I want to bring to this. As well as an understanding that it's time for us to talk about what our professional values are. And I'll talk a little bit about that more later. But that's what I want to bring. I want to bring a deep sense of an understanding of the organization, a belief in the organization and its power to move us forward, that we need to continue to advocate in many different realms for what counseling is, and to begin to have that discussion about what our professional values are that we take on when we become professional counselors. Very good. Thank you for those introductory statements. Uh, Dr. Francis, how would ACA be better off because you were president? You know, as I said earlier, and, and, and Thelma, I know will agree with this, it doesn't matter which one of us is elected. Um, we're both accomplished professionals. We, we will lead the profession forward. But, but I want to correct something. I think the question is in error. The idea that ACA would be better off due to the impact of one person creates a false sense of power and expectancy on that one person. ACA is not one person. ACA is a team of people focused on the goals of promoting and supporting the members of, Ameri of the American Counseling Association and the profession of counseling. You know, I would become part of a team, albeit the president, should I be elected. And in that role, I would bring an understanding of our work as a team, that we seek to utilize all of us, whether it be people in the, in the professional office, people like Scott Barstow, or the people that Scott Barstow touches as he helps train others to advocate for the profession in both local, state, and federal legislatures. You know, an example of that, for the last several months, I've been working with a tremendous group of professionals. Shannon's one of them who are working to update the ACA Code of Ethics. Now, several people have come to us, they've looked at the work we're doing, and they say, you're doing a marvelous job. And I say, it's not me, it's us as a team. You know, and that's how we're doing this. We're coming together as a team to promote the profession. And I'm honored to lead these people, and I do set the vision, and I do set the focus of this group. But trust me, 
It's not my product, it's our product. I'm working, or have just finished working with another group of colleagues on the 2020 uh, uh, debate, as it were, though <laughs> that four hours did seem a bit like a debate, on trying to define counseling to set a scope of practice. We work together as a team, albeit one that would argue, but respectfully, and to set that focus, to set that goal. I've had the great honor of working with a group of professionals trying to come up with a special edition of the JCD, a special section for the JCD, that's addressing the concerns of the Ward v. Wilbanks and the Keaton versus ASU cases. Because we as a profession need to understand what the impact of that is on us and how we need to respond and better define who we are. So how would ACA be better off with me as president? Well, I would provide that vision, that focus, leadership, that seeks to promote and support our members in the profession of counseling to set realistic and achievable goals for the team of ACA as we work towards the continued improvement of our services, the educational opportunities, and the advocacy for the profession in the face of, well, come on, stiff competition. How many of you have been in the state legislature and people have looked at you and said, well, we have psychologists and social workers for that. Why do we need counselors? Or have been someplace and had somebody say, well, what is a counselor? To advocate for the profession that way. So I would hope to bring those skills that I have not only as a counselor and a counselor educator, but as a successful and creative leader. Thank you, Perry. Dr. Duffy? So like Perry, I struggled with the question. In fact, I looked the definition of better off up because I thought, what exactly do they mean? Because like Perry, I agree that we lead teams and we work with teams and this is a collaborative, a collaborative effort. But I can tell you that as a leader of the team, I would work tirelessly to advocate for our profession and to educate the public on who we are. I'm curious as to whether any of y'all have ever Googled the difference between professional counseling and other mental health professionals. You have? What'd you find? Some very mixed up responses. It's pretty amazing. I am always amazed when I see the misinformation and the misrepresentation, I even looked it up this morning just to see if it was accurate, the misinformation and the misrepresentation that you can find on the internet uh, related to our profession. And ACA is doing an amazing job working as hard as it can to take care of that. And, and I know that through my work on Governing Council and I know that through all my colleagues on 2020 and, and every other way. But like I said earlier, this is something that we need to address aggressively as members. And I believe we can do this from a grassroots level and through national initiatives. Bottom line is people need to know who we are and what we do and why that matters. They need to know about the high quality of our work and the rigor of our training. And we can all be a part of making that happen. In my leadership roles, what my passion is bringing people together for a common goal. And I can see that this is one that would be timely, important, and great to do together. With respect to my leadership, I've held leadership roles at the state, regional, and national levels. Uh, in collaboration with my colleagues, we spearheaded a national division within ACA. I established a national peer-reviewed journal and continue to sustain the journal as editor. I believe that my record reflects one of taking vision to action and productivity. On a pragmatic level, I bring a certain business experience to the table through my private practice. As a department chair, I lead a large department and manage a million plus dollar budget. I know that it takes a dynamic team to lead the work that we're doing here. And it would be my true privilege to lead it. Thank you. Thank you, Thelma. The next question 
Dr. Duffy, some clinical counselors are leaving ACA for organizations such as Psychotherapy Networker, reporting that we are oriented toward counselor educators and students, and they are oriented toward the clinician. Clinicians are buying our webinars. What else could we offer to clinicians to make them feel their membership with ACA is of clear value to them and to their clinical work? There you go. Well, thank you, Brad. Actually, that's a question I've given an awful lot of thought to because I am a clinician and I'm always looking for resources for my practice and for my clients. I'm also a counselor educator and many, many of our students want to work in clinical settings, so this is an issue that's important to them as well. But with respect to this question, I'd want to back up a little bit and I'd want to get some facts. What are the people who are leaving ACA telling us? What information do we have? What are clinicians saying they need? Because I'd want to know that in order to inform our next steps. Now if I had to guess, I'd say that we could approach this on two levels. So the first would be addressing clinical needs in, in the pragmatic ways that Perry and I have been talking about this morning. Public perception, uh, parity, and license portability. We can create a home for, for clinicians as we create space for clinicians for us in the bigger world. On a second level, it's resources. ACA has uh, worked very hard and we have new research centers and, and, and as Brad said, actually I remember sitting in a governing council subcommittee where we were brainstorming how we could use technology to meet the needs and we came up with at that time Webinars, what if we had webinars? What if we had podcasts? How could we do this? And it's been very exciting to see those implemented so quickly and be so successful. In addition, I've, um, I've been involved in co-chairing the newly launched ACA ACC Creative Ac Interventions and Activities Clearinghouse, which was created by grad students and counselors for counselors. And our purpose is to create a database of information and ideas that people could quickly reference. But a, a, a byproduct of this that I'm hoping will happen is that for clinicians who are not able to actively come to conferences or be a part of some of this because of the limits of the practice and the financial costs involved in that, for clinicians to find a way to give back, participate, find a community, and, and give to the profession. Because I think it's by people finding a place within an organization that they're going to want to belong. That's what I think. Thank you. Thank you, Thelma. Dr. Francis. You know, being both part of the Governing Council with Thelma and part of the Executive Council with ACCA, I have a very unique view of this. Several years ago, when I was part of the Executive Council um, of ACCA, before I moved into the Governing Council position, I got together with my friends and we said, with my colleagues, and we, we said, you know, we need our own conference. ACA conference is marvelous, but we need something focused on the practitioner of college counseling. And from that point, we began to develop the idea of a college counseling conference, and we brought it to fruition with a lot of hard work during my presidency, we created it, and then as past president, it came to be in Georgia when we had our very first conference. We've now gone from every other year to now every year. Focusing our presentations to making sure that they're focused on the practitioner so that that person has some place to go to get the education that they need that helps them do their job. Before ACA created the webinar, we were already there. And we were there because, well, our members needed it. Why? Because, well, when you're a college counselor, you don't always get to leave the university and get to go to conferences. I've participated in those conferences. I, I, I'm, 
a presenter for three different companies doing those webinars. And right about that time, they began to take off. We were there in the forefront. But again, it's not just about doing it. It's about focusing on the needs of what the profession wants. Identifying, in our case for college counselors, there was a lot of behavior intervention teams being created and we focused our presentations with uh, Brian Van Brunt, who's very good at this, to talk about what is the counselor's role in that? What are the ethics around it? That's my area that I love so much. What are the ethics around that? And now that's coming up here. And, and like Thelma, I agree. What is, what is it that other people are asking for that we're not providing that they need? And to find that out. Well, let me give, when this question came out, the first thing I did was I went to the Psychotherapy Networker website. And I also went to the Evolution of Psychotherapy website. Those two websites, those two organizations, Evolution of Psychotherapy has a conference about every four years. And uh, Psychotherapy Networker, they have theirs every year and the way they advertise it. Take a look at who's presenting. Take a look at the subjects that they're presenting on. It's very focused, very practical information. And it's something that, well, quite frankly, we need to think about doing. And that is inviting the experts in the field to come to ACA and offer their services. They may not always be AC ACA members, but that's the job of the organization, to identify those persons who have something to offer to our members and to provide it to them. Now think about this. ACA has already started to do this, and I want to support them in that, in that effort. Take a look at the webinars we already offer. We've got one coming up on depression. We've already done PTSD. We're doing more in the areas that our, that our professionals are asking for. Not just school counselors, not just clinical counselors, not just college counselors, but information that everybody needs. And then what I'd also like to see us begin doing, because it's important for us to be able to not certify, because that gets into a, a different legal area, but to say to people, we're saying these people have taken these courses and to have tracks. Now, as the governing council, we, we did this just, just this last meeting in trauma and disaster training. Our task force reported, which I was the liaison to, reported out that one, we need to create a database, we're going to do that. And two, we need to begin to create courses, whether it be in a learning institute or focused sessions throughout the convention that people at the end of it can get some sort of certificate of completion. And I want to take it just another step further. Why can't we as ACA contract with some organization that already does this training, other than the Red Cross, because the Red Cross we're a partner with, and say, you provide this training. Now what we want to do is contract with you to provide this training at a specific time, say a convention, and we'll offer it at a reduced rate for our members. So I want to address those two things, getting the best people in and to offer it at a rate that our members can afford. Because quite frankly, I know you, you know this as well, because I, I govern the, the, the counseling clinic budget, you govern your department's budget. Money doesn't grow on trees anymore. I know it used to in Texas. They <laughs> called really. it oil. Uh, they called it oil. But, but it, it stopped growing on trees. And, and so um, we've got to help our counselors get the most bang for their buck. Thank you, Perry. The next question, if we can start, Dr. Francis. If you're elected president, identify three strategic goals or priorities you would implement to move our profession forward and explain why each one of these goals is important for you to accomplish. You know, as I, as I started with, and you and I both agree on this, it, it's so important that we advocate for the profession. And, and increasingly so at the, at the national and state level. Now, we do a marvelous job. We've increased staffing in the legislative area, and we've made some significant inroads. And we need to maintain those roads. And that's the problem. Right now in Michigan, they want to charge extra taxes on our gas so we can rebuild the infrastructure of the roads because they're falling apart. If we don't continue to provide that funding, if we don't continue to hammer away at the legislators, we're going to see us backtrack on the work that we have accomplished with both TRICARE and the VA. You know, the VA accepted counselors many years back for employment. But it took them, what, 10 years? For, and it took our continued hammering for them to start writing the job description so people could get hired. 
Now the second piece of that, that advocacy, and I, I know I've got to be quick because we're running out of time, is at the state level. We have had, well, a perfect example. Uh, in Tennessee right now, they're trying to pass bills that would allow for what I call discriminatory referrals. We have to train our local people, continue to train our local people with the help of ACA so that we can advocate and make sure that those bills don't pass. Secondly, we need to identify the values of counseling. The Ward v. Wilbanks case, the Keaton versus ASU case, and, and, and these are just examples of places where uh, we as a profession need to say, this is what we believe, and this is how it's played out. If you go into the literature, we don't, we're not clear on that. And we need to identify that. Within the Ethics Revision Task Force, the revisions we're coming with are being much more clear about that. And then we need to work on implementing portability. 2020 has finished its work, and now we need to take that work and move forward. Why is that important? I've lived in three states, been licensed in three states, Louisiana, Texas, and Michigan. When I left Louisiana to go to Texas, Texas said to Louisiana, you know, that's all nice and fine, but our laws are different. When I came to Michigan, huh, that's all nice and fine, our laws are different. We need to be able to say this is what we as a profession believe counselors are, not just state by state, but nationwide, and begin to standardize that, the education, the scope of practice, the identity. Thank you, Perry. Dr. Duffy. Dr. Erford. <laughs> so ACA has identified four strategic priorities. So I would like to use that structure to identify my three goals. And like Perry, I, I believe we're all in agreement that advocating for the profession is what we need to do. And I'll, I'll just touch on that one so briefly because it's been said and, and I've said it in for brevity of time. That, that would be my very first priority. The second strategic priority that Governing Council has identified that I completely um, am supportive of and, and would work very hard toward would be balancing practice and academia slash research. And my reason for that is that both are integral to our profession. And they inform one another. My vision would be to someday create research teams and practice teams where you have practitioners helping research identify what it is that, that we need to research and vice versa. I actually got a call two weeks ago from a task force with the Association for Assessment um, and Research and Counseling and asking for collaboration on this issue and I'm really excited because I believe that that collaboration could truly help move this uh, priority forward. Now the third one, I'm, I, they talk in Governing Council about getting into the weeds, but I'm going to get into the weeds on this one. Um, I would look at strengthening the profession, which is one of the priorities, but what I would love to see is to see us strengthening the, prior, the, the organization by using our power for the good. We have 50, over 55,000 members, is that right? With talents, with abilities, with skills that make a difference every day. What if we were to organize ourselves around a societal cause? and be the organization that truly addressed an issue. There could be many. Violence, addiction, trauma, bullying. Think of all we hear about bullying. Counseling Today just had an article on that last month. If we were to either partner with an organization that already addresses bullying like there is, or on our own create a no, it, it is not cool to humiliate people because of their size, their race, their gender, their disability, their sexual orientation, because they don't look or think like you, or because, just because you can and they don't belong to your group. Imagine if we were to do that. Imagine if we were to use our strength to empower others. 
See, I see strengthening an organization as being using our creativity, our collective creativity, to focus on an issue and using that to empower others. That's, that's how I would do that. Thank, Thank you, Velma. Um, we're running uh, about uh, a little behind, of course. Would, would either of you mind if we uh, took the last question and then uh, went into our final uh, comments? We might run a little bit over uh, when we were supposed to start. But is that okay with both of you? Works. Absolutely. Great. Then, Dr. Duffy, the fourth question that I have prepared for you is, with society facing new and escalating challenges, including widespread natural disasters, the prol proliferation of mass shootings, and a still struggling economy, the counseling profession is evolving to meet the needs of people affected by these circumstances. As such, professional counselors are turning to the American Counseling Association for assistance, training opportunities, and guidance as they navigate these complex issues. Please share your ideas regarding the best way to support our members who are striving to provide essential services at such a critical time. Thanks, Brad. Well, actually, I've been one of those counselors for a good part of my career because a good part of my own work has been working with um, people in crisis and trauma and dealing with the grief that goes with it. <coughs> More specifically, I began my career working with children who are chronic and terminally ill. And much of my job at that point was to be with the children until they died and then to be with the parents and the siblings after that. What, what greater crisis could there be in somebody's life, in a parent's life, than to deal with that? And one of the things that I'm really grateful for is that ACA has um, a task force that was formed in 2010 and um, a, an interest network. And I would want to build on their efforts to see what we could do. I was really excited, as Perry mentioned, the other, just two days ago, Governing Council passed a motion to work with training counselors, providing services, and a registry, which I think is hugely important for, for counselors everywhere. One of the things that we could also do, as Perry talked about uh, contracting with others, I was looking at the VA site and the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and they have pretty amazing offerings. In fact, we use a lot of their materials when we teach our grief, crisis, grief and loss classes. And what if we were to see about partnering with them? They're already visible. They have a beautiful website. We could bring our talent and our people to help implement it. I think partnerships like these could increase our visibility <coughs> and it could get our members involved and it could partner us with existing organizations. I've had um, a couple of experiences with regard to disaster that, let, that really brought close to home the idea of counselors needing help. The first was um, a while back when I was a professor at Texas State, Texas had what they called the 100 year flood. And several of my students and a colleague lost their homes and everything they had. And because they didn't have flood insurance because you only have a flood 100 years, you don't think about that, they, there was no recourse. And, and we all worked very hard in those circumstances. My home was flooded and I was lucky. My practice was flooded and I wasn't able to work in it for several months because, uh, because it took that much to clean out the debris. Again, I was lucky. The restaurant that was across the street that we ate at most days, we actually saw float down the street. So the next experience was Hurricane Katrina, which most of you, are, I'm sure all of us, know about. And I can tell you how humbling that was. And that was one that t took me to a completely different level because I hadn't been affected. But I worked with evacuees who came to San Antonio. And I was there 
to see the rows and rows and rows of cots with people sitting on them with, with all they had underneath them, looking for their families, looking for their pets. And I got to go home and I got to be to my world that was intact. And I was able to take a bath. And I just laid in my bed and I looked up at the ceiling and I remember the faces of the people that I had met that day. And it was very powerful. And those of you who, who joined me in some of that and who led me in, in some of those efforts know that counselors do need care during those times. And this morning, Ashley Judd talked about vicarious trauma. We do have that. So how can we take care of ourselves? ACA Foundation has a Counselor's Care Fund which I believe is, is, is something we need to remember to educate people about, and it's something we need to continue to give to. Thank you. Thank you, Thelma. Thelma. Dr. Francis. You know, I'm, I'm always deeply moved when I hear stories like this, because it reminds me of, of, of um, the many tragedies that affect all of us. Years ago, um, while I was on a break from school, Arizona had a similar 100 year flood and down where my father's business was and so during that time I went and worked with the American Red Cross volunteered went down to the area that was closest to the Gila River and was going in to homes talking with people with in the midst of what little they had and part of my job was to tell them you can't keep your mattress now imagine, you know, this is one of your last possessions that didn't float away. You can't keep it because of the typhus and the other things, that, the diseases that would rise from that wet uh, cotton. And to go into somebody's home and see where the mud had risen, and you could literally see it, and, and to go uh, where Hurricane uh, Katrina's little sister had gone through uh, Texas and to go and help rebuild homes when I was uh, doing that reminded me of our need for two things. To be proactive and reactive. Proactive, we do very little training, although now it's part of the KCREP requirements to help people understand how to provide crisis and trauma services. But that's not all. We do a lot of work in training people and saying to them, if a child reports to you abuse, you need to report it to CPS. What do you do after that? How do you help the family after that? And when you go home at night, how do you deal with that? Um, how do you, you know, and you, you and I have had the same dreams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you see the faces of the people, you wonder what we can do. So that involves the proactive part, to be prepared both educationally to contract with those companies to provide that training, to tap into our own database of people who have that, to offer the training for counselors to do both the good work and the self-care work. So how's that done? That's the leadership that I would bring, is knowing and helping identify with the staff, those people, those companies who could provide the training that, well, quite frankly, doesn't always take place in a counseling program. Uh, we graduate with what? Basic knowledge. And uh, we train counselors. It's the clients who help build the clinician. And to learn how to work, to take those skills that we train you as a counselor to become an adequate and proficient and excellent clinician is part of our work as ACA. To provide extra training, to connect people to mentors and supervisors so that when they're faced with these traumatic events, they know how to, how to respond. The second thing is reactively. And that is when ACA is involved in these events, to be able to identify the resources for our counselors to use, whether it be uh, pointing them in the direction like just recently with the, with the mass shootings. Here are practice briefs. Here is information that we already have. If you're heading in that direction, you need to know this. But there are other people that we, we oftentimes focus on ourselves. What can we offer? What can we do? But there are other people. You know, 
we can talk to the public as ACA. We can do those things that are necessary uh, with news releases, with newspapers, with websites that aren't focused at the counselor only, but at the general public. Here are things you need to know. I'm always envious when these, when these uh, 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 events happen and you hear, well, from the American Psychological Association, they have said, you should put your feet in cold water. And my next question, well, what's the ACA say? We have just as much research, we tap into the same resources, and we need to be able to say, not just to our members, but to the public our members work with, these are the identified things that we know work or the resources that you have available to you if you can't get to a counselor. And to let the public know that counselors care. As the shirt said, be calm, call a counselor. And if you can't call a counselor, here's the ACCA website, and here's some, here's some information for you that will help you before you get to that counselor. So what, what do we need to do? Provide that training, and then reactively to have the resources already available for the counselors and the public. Thank you, Perry. It's time to uh, uh, move into some closing remarks, uh, and let's go ahead and start with Dr. Francis. You know, either one of us, and, and our, our, I believe, would be excellent, excellent presidents. That sounds really egotistical, but I, I don't mean it to be. They both be excellent presidents. Thank you very much. You bailed me out there. I appreciate that. Um, because I think we, we follow in the footsteps of prior presidents. We don't do this alone. We've never done it alone. There's always a steep leaning, learning curve. It's the same thing with governing council. It's the same thing with division presidency. It's the same thing with region uh, chairs, well, both of which we've all done. We've all, we, we've done the many things that train us for leadership. But it's when you get into that office that you begin to connect with people who have already done it, who help teach you. I'm open to that learning as well as well prepared to jump into the shoes and get going. I bring with me the experience of a division president, of a governing council representative, of uh, an ethics chair, of all the different things that help prepare you. But I also bring with me my own person, my genuineness, my hope, my commitment to the profession. You know. There's been a shift professionally. We join organizations for what we get. 30 years ago, we joined organizations because that's what we were supposed to do. I still believe that's possible. It's what we're supposed to do to help identify ourselves and our profession, to lift it up, not because of what we get from the profession, but because what we can give to the profession and give to others. So it works both ways. And that's what I want to bring, is that commitment to the profession, that vision that we are professional counselors, well-trained, well-versed, and prepared to work with people and to let other people know, both our colleagues and the other mental health professions and the general public and the legislatures. That's what I want to bring, is that we're, we're ready. We've been ready for years. It's time to listen. Thank you, Perry. Dr. Duffy? Well, I'd like to close by thanking you for coming to ACA's first ever Meet the Candidates Forum. This is, yeah. Perry and I were saying, we, 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 were, we were the forerunners for, for being here today. My goodness. And like Perry, I would be so thrilled to learn, my goodness, as I even look in this room, of, of the leaders of the past presidents who inspire me and who serve as my role models and that I would be so open and hopeful to learn from. I would want to bring my clinical, supervisory, business, and higher education leadership to help me. We've accomplished and will continue to accomplish many things as an organization. And like Perry said, either way this goes, 
ACA is doing great things. I'd love to be part of the leadership, though, that expands opportunities for students, for counselors, and for the public because of what we do. And I believe we do that by supporting one another and by being proud, vocal, and unified. I am personally very proud to belong to an organization that has wellness, context, diversity, and relationships as its guiding principles. Because that's what it's about. Touching the lives of the children, the families, the groups that sit with us, that's what it's about. And I like working hard. And I like thinking big. And I like working out the details that put vision into action. So if this position is about hard work, big ideas, and working with others, I'm in. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to both of you for sharing your insights and strategies, priorities. I think that it's easy to see just in the last 45 minutes, first of all, why I hold both of these individuals in such high esteem. And I think it's also equally easy to see that regardless of who becomes the 60 64th president Fourth. of the American Fourth. Counseling Association, that we're going to be in incredibly good hands uh, in the years moving forward. Please uh, join me in expressing my appreciation for our candidates today. Thank you, Dr. Perry Francis and Dr. Thelma Duffy for sharing Yay. all of this wonderful information with us today. And best of luck to you. It's now time for you, the members, to decide who will be the 64th president of the American Counseling Association. Polls open December 1st, 2013, <laughs> and close January 31st, 2014. So please come out and vote. Thank you all. Thank you.